I work in the area of mental health. And one thing that I've noticed, especially nowadays in the last maybe 10, 15 years, there's a strong emphasis on uh, children. And just a week or this week or a week ago, there was on the radio in news that children are more anxious, they are suffering from anxiety more now than it has been before. And uh, if you look at that, before that it was kind of common for adults to have anxiety. But now children are suffering more anxiety. And if, when I look at that, it takes me back to where I come from. At the age of 15, I got involved in politics. I grew up during apartheid era in South Africa. And I was 15 many years ago. <laughs> yeah. And when I started to, learn, to read about our history, it dawned to me that uh, something is not right. Something is just not right. And um, I was raised in a Methodist family. And I used to go to church up until I was around 11. And then after that, I can't remember what happened in terms of church, but I was not uh, in the church anymore. But when I reached the age of 15, it dawned to me that there's something wrong. And then I read about the history of our country. When I read about the origins of apartheid and why things are, there, are, there, are, are, are the way they were, a question to me came to say, because apartheid was, an institu was instituted by a church and the government, a question came to my mind. He said, if God is so good and loving, why would he allow his subjects to commit such a uh, cruel, cruel system? And from then on, I took a decision that there's no reason to follow anything about religion because I accepted the Marxist uh, Marxist philosophy, uh, which informed me also that uh, religion is like an opium, which is there to tame our minds, to make us obey those who are in, in power. And I accepted that. And then on top of it, I said, another thing that I need to do away with, because it's not helping me, is the belief in ancestors, because in my culture, we believe in ancestors. And you have to do some rituals in your ancestral worship. And I said, this also is not helping me in terms of coming to know that I have an ability to free myself. I have to do things to appease the ancestors all the time. What about me? Don't I have powers within myself to, to be able to free myself? And then I said, no ancestors. And then I said, when it comes to God, theories. Why should I believe in God? And therefore, there's no God and there's no Satan. At that time, I didn't know anything about atheism. And I didn't view myself as an atheist then. But when I look at it now, I said, okay, these are the atheist views. But as we were learning from Sabbath school this morning about the great controversy, it came a time where the explanation of the great controversy made sense to me. Marxism taught me that there is thesis and antithesis. And then when these two are in conflict, you come up with what is called synthesis. So these two have to be in conflict, and then the end result is synthesis. Meaning that for us to have a better community, we need to change our society. And that change will only come when these two forces come together and get in conflict and free themselves. And then we will get a, a classless society. But then when I came to Adventism, I won't, I won't get to that story as to how it came about, but in a nutshell, when I came into Adventism, I came for some strange reasons, but, and I kept on arguing that you can't tell me about God because why is so much suffering? Why is so much suffering? Tell me. I remember 
even before I joined the Adventist Church, I saw this Christian, I was doing year, year 12 then. This Christian, strong Christian guy from the Pentecostal churches, he was so strong in school. And I just stood there one time and I stood up and said, look, look, I've been into religion stuff. Where is God? And all that stuff. I asked him tough questions. The only answer he gave me said, your questions, I don't know about them. And I don't have answers. And stop talking to me about this because you are just being, uh, he used, I mean, in my language, I can't explain it, but he is kind of yeah, being rebellious, something like that. He couldn't give me answers. But when I looked at the concept of the, of the great controversy, it made sense to me that the, the war between good and evil, like thesis and antithesis, should be in conflict. And then that conflict will culminate into the second coming. And then when I looked at human nature as well, Classless society in this sinful world is just impossible. You have to kill all of us if you want to implement classless society and bring the classless society of socialism. Otherwise, human nature wants something out of whatever we do, and then it's not going to work. But when I look at uh, uh, the story of Jesus and his disciples, Getting straight to our sermon now, it takes me back to my childhood. It brings me back to where I am now with my work. When I see young people, children of five years, I work with children from zero to, uh, to 18 years old. See all these children of these ages coming with all these troubles. And then when I look at all the strategies that we use, it comes to the point to me when I say, yes, these strategies are great, but there is something that is missing. And that thing is the Jesus that I've experienced. Because the difference that he made in my life, even if I come across any difficult situation, it is him who keeps me going. With these kids, I give them strategies, breathing, um, whatever I do with them. But there is nowhere where they can say, I will hold on this and live with it. And the hope that is not only for now. And give an, an explanation of what actually is happening. Then, with all that information about the history of my country, children that I'm working with today, I looked at the, at the story of Jesus with his disciples. I used the, 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 the story from the book of Matthew. This story comes from three books. The book of Luke, the book of Mark, and the book of Matthew, which is the book that I'm going to be focusing on mainly. And I've entitled my sermon, When Jesus is in the Boat, No Storm Can Sink It or even the stormiest storm will never sink it. So when Mark, when you look at the book, uh, let's go to the book of uh, Matthew, chapter 8. So uh, we start from verse 18, and then we'll, we'll read verse 18 and uh, up to 27. Now, when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. This is the reason why I'm, I'm reading this part. Because when you read the other, I mean, the other gospel writers, you find this part in this story. But in, this, in, in Matthew, he doesn't go straight into this part. He goes around. Then verse 19. Then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. 
And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and let the dead bury the dead, their own dead. Now, verse 23. Now, when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly, a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the man marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the seas obey him? When you look, I mean, when you view this story from the eyes of Matthew, you find out in chapter 8, he kind of begins a different journey in Jesus' life. The previous chapters, you find out he talks, he talks about Jesus, who's a great teacher. But when he gets to chapter 8, Jesus becomes the great physician. And when we specifically look at the portion that we read, which has to do with the coming of the storm, Jesus is the great healer, not only for physical ailments, but also he can cure the environmental conditions. Which is uh, very interesting when you look at it. One, I would like to look at uh, what Jesus did in, in the first part of the, chap- of the chapter. The first part, he deals with leprosy. If you go in the Old Testament and try to also understand the Jewish understanding of what leprosy is, their understanding of leprosy was that it was God's punishment on people because of what they've done. If you remember when Elisha was uh, to attend to Naaman, the king of Israel said, when, when Naaman came to him, he said, I've been sent to come to you for leprosy. He said, am I God that I should cure leprosy? That is their understanding that God is the one who makes leprosy or makes people experience leprosy. And what is Jesus doing here in this, in this I mean, Matthew's drawing to, to our attention is that Jesus, he is the God who, if you know the history of leprosy and our understanding of leprosy, he is the God who is able to cure the leprosy that we know as coming from God. And if you look at the history of leprosy as well, there was nowhere where they had uh, physicians who would cure the leprosy. But always, it was always the priests. Who, people were sent to the priests to deal with the issue of leprosy. But then, in this case, when the leper came, Jesus doesn't only just heal, I mean, uh, respond to him. He heals the, lepros- the leper from the leprosy. So Jesus uh, is the God. And the second part of the, of the chapter is Jesus healing the centurion's servant. What is interesting about the centurion is that he was not a Jew. He was a Roman. And Jesus was showing them that when it comes to the gospel, there is no, uh, there is no favoritism. You can come as a man in high command, or you can come as a servant, and God's healing power is there for you. And then we get Peter's mom-in-law. Peter's mom-in-law is sick of flu. And Jesus heals her. 
what Matthew is drawing us there is that when you look at all what has happened, Jesus also is for the Jews. The healing that has been done to the centurion's servant is the healing that is relevant for the Jews as well. But where my focus is today is on the coming of the storm. What I would like us to notice here is that uh, if you look at the previous instances, Jesus has done all these powerful things and he's been, I mean, his disciples has witnessed him doing these things. And then he's inviting them to cross over to the other side of the lake. The first thing that we see is that when Jesus invited them, they hopped on a boat. Meaning that the invitation is free. Invitation is for everyone. There are no conditions for invitation. And Jesus doesn't go around and check if these people are worthy. Because their worthiness is not on them. It not, worthiness is not dependent on them. It depends on who is calling them, which is Jesus. So meaning that our worth, which is, which, which is uh, what I was referring to when I was saying, when we look at the ailments that we have, especially in the men area of mental health, our people are always referred to all these modalities. And when it comes to area of politics, we are always referred to better systems. But Jesus can heal the storms of life and help us to live within those with contentment and survive them because we, he is not only the hope for the future, he is hope for us now to carry us to the future, which is the difference between what uh, we as human beings can do for ourselves. So when Jesus invited his disciples, they were invited unconditionally. And so you and I are. When Jesus uh, established or started the church, it's like the boat that he invited his disciples to. He's inviting you and me. Regardless of your background, regardless of your status in society, he is saying, come. Come in the boat with me. And it is in the boat where you are going to learn about Jesus. So trusting him and coming in the boat with him is the best option. And then something happens. Immediately when they're in the boat, I guess what was happening when they hop on the boat, started their journey, there must have been a great excitement because Jesus had done all these great things. Maybe one was saying, you know, I think uh, Jesus, I so wish that he can help me to be a great physician like he did with that man. Or maybe one was saying, oh, if he could help me to be the great speaker or something. All those sorts of good things that Jesus had done. But immediately, I mean suddenly, a great storm come. What I, what I notice about the great storm is that the battle is of the Lord. The battle is of the Lord. And uh, going back to what I've said about our means of trying to help our elements in society, when we rely and depend on human beings for solutions, their solutions go up to a certain extent doesn't matter how great the, what, the modality or, or the med, medis, medication, we all end up suffering what all human race suffer, which is death in the end. But now, Jesus has called his disciples to come in the boat with him. And they have all this experience with him. And suddenly, a storm, a storm comes. I'm sure when the storm t started, they started to think about their skills. 
they started to think about their experiences in the sea, and they probably started to analyze, or oh, because the wind is coming from this direction, this might come to an end soon, or because it's coming from this direction, it's not gonna come to an end soon. And because it's coming from this direction, maybe it's too dangerous. And then that brought anxiety on them. But didn't they see Jesus doing things out there? Didn't they see Jesus performing miracles? Why panic? Why panic? It goes back again to what I've said before, that when Jesus invited them, he invited them unconditionally. And their success in their Christian journey didn't depend on their knowledge or their wisdom. It depended on their dependence on him because he was the source of their power and strength. So when the, when the storm came, they tried what they could do and ultimately realized that they couldn't do anything. But what, what is interesting when you look at this, in the period of the storm is that Jesus was asleep. Jesus was asleep. This is a situation that uh, makes me think about all the challenges that we have in our world today, which led me to think that there is no God. Because if Jesus, if God is so great, why so much suffering? If Jesus is in the boat, can't he hear that there's a storm to come and come the storm and help his disciples? Where is Jesus when it hurts? Why bad things happen when he's the great God who can change situations? But one thing that the Bible tells me is that God, which is Jesus, was Jesus yesterday. He is Jesus today, and he will be Jesus tomorrow. Circumstances do change, and they will always change. But God doesn't change. And the fact that circumstances change doesn't change God, the fact that God is God. So, what is happening with the disciples and Jesus in the boat, sleeping where, when they are in trouble? It dawned to them again that they were not alone. They were not alone. They remembered that Jesus was with them, hence going to ask for him. When they called Jesus, Jesus became the answer. One thing I like about Jesus is that uh, when they called him, he comes to realize that their faith has been compromised. They started to panic. They started to panic while they knew that they were with him. They started to do things trying to solve the problem for themselves. And then when they couldn't do anything, only then that they realized that they need to go to Jesus. Trusting their own power. But when Jesus responds, Jesus doesn't say why you started with your own, trusting your own power. Jesus showed them that the issue here was faith, your faith. However, I accept you unconditionally. You are mine and I'm going to work with you. Your weaknesses are far less when it comes to my love for you. My love for you cannot, compare, cannot be compared to your weaknesses because my strength and my grace is enough to carry you through. So Jesus stood up and calmed the storm because Jesus is the answer. Doesn't matter how great the storm is, when Jesus is in the boat, the storm becomes like 
a piece of wind because Jesus is the God above all. Um, but what I want us to look at this, I mean, to take from this story for ourselves is that as the church, we are called, we are God's called ones. We are a chosen generation. We are peculiar to God. And he doesn't, our peculiarity to him is not dependent on what we do. It depends on who he is because he is the one who makes us what he wants us to be. So, when we look at the story of the disciples, I want us to see, one, the fact that they were with Jesus. With Jesus. They've witnessed him, and they've seen him doing all these great things. And when they came to the boat, they came with that experience. And that experience stayed with them, all right? And because human nature always comes up, when the storm came, they started to have some doubts and tried to do things on their own. But again, the seed that has been planted before regenerated again and helped them to remember where the source of their strength comes from and led them to Jesus. And Jesus became the answer again in their lives. So for us today, as a church, we are called like the disciples. We come in in the church and we have heard the stories of Jesus. In fact, we have experienced Jesus somehow. But that doesn't stop the storm to come. That doesn't stop the storm to come. But when the storm comes, Jesus is the answer. He is the great physician. He is the great uh, physicians, not only for illnesses, physical illnesses, but both for our physical and also, more importantly, for our spiritual uh, conditions. So today, what is important for us is to remember when we come in the boat, we come as human beings. Human beings who have experiences, but Jesus is I mean, our experience with Jesus will determine our journey with him. So I would like to invite you today and say, when we see what is happening around us, let us remember that the conditions of the world will always change. There will be different uh, situations happening. There will be wars happening. All these things that are happening that are bringing us anxiety in us does and do not change who God is. God has the best for us and he is the best answer for our world. And I want to commend him to each and one of you today and to myself, that Jesus be the answer because no storm can ever sink the boat where Jesus is. Amen.